On your first point, uh, you, we just read a letter from a Yale uh, student saying we need yes. to divest our, our Yale endowment from this country. You know, where where is Pung? Where what are they doing with respect to human rights? And by the way, the IOC, I should also mention, they were supposed to meet with a group that wanted to ask about forced labor in China. They were like, mm, don't really want to, but I guess we will. And then they then they said, no, we're not meeting with you. Uh, first, they said, well, we'll sit there for an active listening session only. We won't be sharing any information with you about whether we are relying on slave labor for some of these clothes and goods. And then as they got closer to the meeting, according to the New York Times, the IOC pulled out entirely from meeting with them, saying, we're not engaged, we're not able to engage in a dialogue at this time. As a result of our differences in approach, we have, we have differences in approach, and therefore there will be no listening by us to you. Um, okay, right? Like that we're not surprised, but I do have an answer for you on what American corporations are going to do about the problems in China when it comes to covering the Olympics. And I give you the the example of the, the very brave NBC. Take a look at, and this is for, I'll describe it for our listening audience, at um, how they are sort of the, their banner to, to promote the Olympics, which they cover and host um, in terms of its broadcasting uh, on American television. It's got Beijing written mm, as big as like, well, any normal human might need a little microscope to to find it. I can't even see it from where I'm sitting on my desk. It's just the Winter Olympics in big letters with Feb 3rd in even bigger letters. And a teeny tiny over on the right. It's almost like one of those trademark signs. Beijing. <laughs> right? <It's> like, <laughs> say, yeah. say it loud. Say it proud. You know, what's so ridiculous about that is that, you know, when the foreign journalists petitioned for to the Beijing Olympic Committee to, for basic access, you're right, there's an Olympics happening. There's hundreds of journalists in China, all the U.S. journalists watching Post, Post journalists were kicked out, but they're trying to cover the thing, trying to fi- figure out if it's safe, what the rules are, you know, what's going to happen. And, you know, the Chinese government told, go, told them all to pound sand. So even as they take the money from the international uh, media organizations, they're treating them like crap. They're not even upholding you know, basic press freedoms surrounding this games, which the the media is and the U.S. corporations are partially funding. So we're giving them the money and taking the abuse. It's a it's insult to injury. And of course, they they do it because they can get away with it because no one stands up. But That's some right. people have stood up. You know, there's a guy named Enes Cantor Freedom who plays for the Celtics. He came on been, the show. You know, yes, he's great on this. I went I, I went to L.A. and interviewed him. And, you know, there's a guy who understands what it is to live under a horrendous dictatorship because his family was uh, imprisoned by Turkish uh, President Erdogan for nothing, for no good reason at all. And uh, so he doesn't care. You know, he he he's he's willing to sacrifice and, you know, he's willing to put his uh, morals above his pocketbook. And the opposite of that, of course, is LeBron James, who won't uh, you know, would never, ever, ever say anything about who actually goes out of his way to defend the CCP and criticized Daryl Morey for tweeting about Hong Kong, criticized yep. N.S. Kanner and accused N.S. Kanner of trying to, quote, unquote, steal his energy because, you know, LeBron James can't understand that somebody might do something for someone that's not them, that's not in their own interest for the benefit of another group of people, you know, that and actually sacrifice. Uh, he assumes it must be in N.S. Kanter's self-interest, but of course it's not. N.S. Kanter Freedom could lose his career over this and he's come to terms with that. And I think, you know, more and more people are stepping up and, you know, Congress passed a bill to prevent slave labor products to come from coming to our shores. Mm-hmm. You know, the Biden administration tried to fight against it. They actually they opposed it secretly until I exposed them. And then they turned around and they're like, OK, fine, we support it. And you could be sure that they're going to try to play games when they implement it, because this is what happens uh, when people are trying to make excuses for a genocide or look away. Uh, but, you know, the other thing is that there's all of these survivors and all of these people who are making it out and uh, their stories are real and their stories are it's harrowing. It's so crazy and- because they're, they're much more worried at the Biden administration about making sure we refer to uh, women who give birth as birthing peoples than <laughs> they are about the Uyghurs with forced sterilizations, Peng Shui, what happened in what's happening, you know, in these forced labor camps. They don't care. Like, and, then they, and never mind what happened in Afghanistan to young women and girls over there and what's still happening, so a crisis we're ignoring um, because, you know, we're so focused on domestic politics and uh, zero COVID here too, right? We're so focused on our own zero, ridiculous goals of zero COVID. Um, but the same organization wants to lecture us on human rights uh, while they 
happily look the other way. They didn't care if they, if if American businesses buy from or sell to uh, companies that use slave labor. They don't care. Yeah, I mean, the Biden administration is split. There are some people who do care and there are some people who don't care. And the problem is that, you know, they see human rights advocacy as a complicating factor in U.S.-China relations rather than what they should see it as, which is the advantage that we have. In other words, if you just think about it, you know, the thing that the Chinese government hates the most is when you point out their genocide. And the reason that they spend billions of dollars <laughs> to propagandize everyone. Every country that engages in genocide really hates that. Just like, yes, <laughs> most genocidal regimes <laughs> don't like it when you uh, focus on it, you know, and they should not like it because it should be embarrassing because it's a one of the worst human rights crimes of our time. And, you know, the Biden people see that as like a problem, right? If you're John Kerry, you, you think, well, if we focus on that, then they're not going to cooperate with us on climate change or Iran or whatever else it is that uh, we think we need them to cooperate on, which they're probably not going to cooperate on anyway, because they don't mm -hmm. care about that stuff because, you know, they're building coal plants. So they're not trying with slave labor. So they're not going to be a climate change champion either way. OK. Mm -hmm. And once the Biden people realize that that and some of them do and some of them don't, to be fair, uh, they'll realize that actually the best thing you can do to fight, uh, you know, the threat of the Chinese Communist Party is to rally people who don't want to live in a world where genocide is the norm. And that kind of unites everybody, it unites Democrats and Republicans, actually it unites Americans and Europeans, not, like nothing really does anymore. And, it, and I it also think about the people in the region who see that and all people who live under dictatorships are like, OK, are we just going to are we just going to have genocides for the 21st century? Is that just what's going to happen? Or is someone going to stand in the way? So I think, you know, the, and this kind of goes back to the COVID thing, too, because, you know, there's a lot that China still hasn't done in terms of telling us what's going on with the coronavirus origins. And, uh, you know, the Biden administration claims to want to know, but they haven't lifted a finger. They've buried the investigation. They never bring it up anymore, even internally or, or with the Chinese. And here's another thing you can think, oh, well, wow, that's going to really make U.S.-China relations tense. Well, that's completely the wrong way to think about it. The, the, the right way to think about it is that, no, no, this is, first of all, something that's really important for our national security. And same thing with genocide. Like, we can't live in a world where genocides are okay, because eventually that will come back to haunt us. Eventually that will pose a threat to us where we are. Once the world is full of genocidal regimes that don't care about what we say or what we do. And so all of these sort of contentious relationships, uh, issues in the U.S.-China relationship, we could use them to protect ourselves and to rally countries to our side and to help these suffering people if we were had a little more strategery. But I think the Biden mm -hmm. uh, people are they're just, you know, they're just not willing. They're not courageous enough to go there. No, they're they're too busy not solving things like the supply crisis and the inflation crisis, and you know not. Well, that's being another able to thing. Think about the supply chain crisis. Fourteen you know. hour pileups resolved. Right, but the supply chain crisis. Think about that. The, a lot of it is because we're so dependent on the supply chains running through China. You know, and a lot of it is because they play games with those supply chains in order to mess with us and all the other countries too. So you know, maybe instead of you know uh, just like cursing the darkness maybe we should light a candle maybe we should realize that actually you know we're going to have to have some uh decoupling that's going to have to run some of this stuff that we need especially in a pandemic around china that's the technology that's the medicine that's the chemicals that's the rare earth materials silicon all that stuff you know if, unless we want to be dependent on chinese slave labor uh forever uh we should probably do something about that now <laughs>